a series, actually towards the end of a series, that we're calling the Stewardship Principle. And in some of this, we've been talking about money, but the first thing that I need you to do if you haven't been with us the last couple of weeks is, is expand that thought because with the idea of stewardship itself, we're not just talking about money. Now, we do talk about it, but it's more than just money itself. And so there's actually, we've been looking at this principle, we were looking at stewardship, and we looked at, at, at why we're called the steward, what stewardship is. And two weeks ago, we talked about this. We gave a really simple definition, right? That all stewardship is, is taking care of what God has provided for the work that God has appointed. It's even rhythmic. That's on purpose. It's one of those like tricks they teach you in like sermon school, right? Taking care of what God has provided for the work that God has appointed. And we know this because we see this in Proverbs 3, and we use it in the New King James Version here. It says, that, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increased. What this means is that with all that we have, we are to honor God. Whether that's with our paychecks, whether that's with our, our finances, whether that's with our time, whether that's with our resources, whether that's with our family, whether that's with the, even maybe even our children. How do we steward what God has provided for God's purpose? And as we've talked about this principle, we've started exploring what that means. And last week, we really kind of did a deep dive into this in the concept of finance itself and tithing and, and what it looks like, not just for that 10, which is what tithe means, 10th, but what does it look like not to steward the 10th, but what does it look like to steward the other 90? And today, I want to look at this even more, not just in the financial aspect, but in this idea of stewardship as a whole. Because I really want us to address and look at the question of what happens when we don't steward well. What happens when we don't steward well? You see, when I was, I don't, I don't know, I put on here 12, but I think I was younger than that. I think I was probably 9, maybe 10, and I got some birthday money. And let me tell you, that birthday money, that $25 was burning a hole in my pocket and had all sorts of big plans for that $25. But when I realized you can't get a jet ski for $25, at least not one that you would want, like I started looking at other things and my dad was like, you may want to save some of that and then you could, you know, maybe you could buy a new video game console. And I'm like, well, that'd be cool. I like video games. Oh, I should go to the arcade. And so my thought is, hey, I'm going to go to the arcade. And here is the terrible thing about arcades is that you spend a ton of money to get these little tickets that you then redeem for prizes that are worth significantly less than the money you spent on them. And at the age of nine is when I had this realization. I took my $25 and I went to the arcade. And look, I know that some of the video games that don't give you tickets are kind of fun, but I wasn't wasting my time on that Joker stuff. I needed those tickets because I wanted some prizes. But like four Tootsie Rolls and two broken Chinese finger traps later, like $25 wasn't worth a pile of junk that I brought home. And in my mind, I'm going, wait, 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 why? What happened? I had $25. I was going to save and get something different. And now I've got this pile of rubbish. I have been had. <laughs> I thought that as a nine-year-old. It's the same principle that a lot of people think when they walk out of casinos. Like, wait, oh, I get it now. This is how they make their money. Off suckers like me. See, at the age of nine, I had the, the blinding realization that being a good steward of that $25 was not going to the arcade because I would not get what I was hoping for and my investment would not be returned to me. And you may say, Joel, weren't some of the games fun? I'm sure, but I don't remember that part. I just remember the disappointment. You see, the truth is, when it comes to stewardship, when it comes to this idea of what we steward, we all struggle with this at some level. Every one of us. And maybe it's, it's in one area and not another. Maybe, you know what, you really work hard and you pray through how you can be a good steward with the finances God has given you. The 10% and the 90%. And maybe that's not where you struggle with this. Maybe, and I think this is going to hit home for a lot of us, maybe the way we struggle with stewardship is we don't steward our time well. When was the last time you really took a Sabbath? You took a day to rest. Oh man, I'm being convicted right now as I stand on stage. 
How well are you at stewarding your time for your family, for the kingdom of God, for your calling? Is it work? Is it hobbies? How are you stewarding your time? Are you doing it well? How are you stewarding the resources, maybe the abilities, the talents God has given you? Is it, well, no, no, no. I know that that I I can do that. I'm just going to wait. I I just can't do it right now. Or maybe it's, hey, I know that God has given me this ability. I'm just too scared. How are you stewarding your possessions? Again, I'm going to go back. Look at this verse again, right? Honor the Lord with your possessions, all your possessions, your time, your resources, your ability, your finances. How are you honoring God? Because the truth of the matter is this, right? Each of us struggle with some area of stewardship. And we may not like to think about it like that, but but if we don't struggle with some area of stewardship, we're not really being human. We all struggle at some level with something. And maybe one or two of these areas, man, we really got down. Maybe you are great with your time and you balance it so well. I am not. That is not me. This is the area of stewardship I struggle the most with, is stewarding my time. Maybe it is finances with you. Maybe you struggle with the 10 or the 90. But at some level, we each are going to fall into a place where we are struggling with something when it comes to stewardship. So what happens when we are bad stewards with what God has given us? And the bigger question is, how do we fix that? I remember, I think it was early college that that I was, I was kind of out on my own for the first time. I, I was handling my own finances. I, I, I had, you know, all of these bills that I had to pay, which I think consisted of like just my cell phone bill. Um, and, but at the time, it was really before I started utilizing, or many people started utilizing online banking. And some of us will remember this. Anybody remember actually balancing your checkbook in your checkbook? Remember that novelty? When like you used to do that, and you would open the back and you would write it all down. Some people are sitting here going like, I still do that, Joel. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. I look online or on my phone, right? It's so much easier. But at the time, right, I would do this and I would do math, which I'm not great at arithmetic, I'll tell you that. And so, but there was a moment in college where I was committed, like I've got to be better at at managing my, my checkbook and my finances. I cannot overdraw my account again. And so I went out to Office Depot, Right, and I bought myself this little like like folder that held all like the bill singular that I got each month in it, and, and, and I had all the receipts that I would have, and I was going to track my spending, and I was going to do a better job of saving, and I was going to do a better job of tithing, and I had all this stuff, and I, and I bought these great pens. You remember the zebra pens, the metal ones? Like they're still like some of the best pens you can possibly buy, and doctors can use them for tracheotomies in case of an emergency. And and so like I got that, and you know what? I was like, I'm gonna. At the time, I also mailed in my uh, my my check for my cell phone bill. And so I got like, uh, like really nice letters and some stamps and, and, and I got this and I went up to the cash register and I wrote a check and I turned in the check and I forgot to record that in the back of my checkbook. And I overdrew my bank account because I was working so hard to try to be a better steward. And I tell you that story, very true story to tell you this. So often that is how we approach stewarding the possessions God has provided us. It's not that we don't have the heart. It's not that we don't have have the desire. It's that we just need a little something more. In our pursuit of God, sometimes we just struggle. And maybe it is with our time, or maybe it is with our money, or maybe it is with the abilities God has given us. If you've been around church, that's the three T's, your time, your talent, and your treasure. Right? And maybe we struggle with one of those. But I think it's okay, because I think that if we look at scripture, that we have some hope in this. And it's okay to, to, to not be okay in those areas, but here's the catch, right? It's not okay to stay not okay. We gotta work at this. We've gotta actually achieve something where we are trying to be better stewards with what God has provided us, whether that be time, whether that be money, whether that be our resources. A few months ago, we read a story 
that Jesus told about a man who was entrusted with a lar- who entrusted his servants with a large sum of money, right? And, and in this, and we have a lot of scripture today, so I'm going to paraphrase and I'm going to fly through some stuff. So if you if you can't stick with me, the notes have links to all the scripture, right? So if you click that, you can go back uh, later and you can see it all. So we're going to paraphrase and then we're going to fly through some. You f- tracking with me? You got it? We good? All right. So Jesus tells this story about this man who has three servants and he's going on a trip and he entrusts him with these great sums of money. And one he gives like three amount and one he gives two and one he gives one. And he comes back and he finds out that the one who he only gave one amount of, uh, of money to has been a bad steward with the talent that he has given him. That's the sum of money. And it was a lot back in the day. This is what we see in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse four, verse 24. And it said, he also who had received the one uh, talent came forward saying, master, I knew you had, you were, you were to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter, where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground here. You have what is yours. Right? So what he did is he took this talent, which is a large sum of money, and instead of trying to steward it well and make more, he hid it. He was scared to possess this great thing that his master had given him, and so he dug a hole and he buried it. He knew it was there. He selfishly protected himself because he didn't want to mismanage it, and so he did nothing with it, and it made his master angry is what it says. Right? Here have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked, slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not sow, or I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And in my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take, so take the talent, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10 talents, right? Give it to the one who had, who stewarded well. And in this story, what Jesus is saying is giving us this example of someone who was a poor steward with the resources he was given. And the result was bad. And the truth is this, right? When we fail to steward what God has given, we will miss the opportunities to serve his kingdom. If you bury your resources in a hole, you cannot serve the kingdom in hiding. If you bury your time in something, if you bury your time into work, you are not leaving room for God to use you for this kingdom. If you bury your talents your abilities. You're not making that space for God to use you for his kingdom. When we are poor stewards, we miss opportunities to serve the kingdom of God. Now there's an assumption that is made with this statement, and that's this. The assumption is that first you have a desire or you have a calling or you feel the need to serve the kingdom of God. And if you're sitting in here and going, hey, you know what? I just want to come and check in in church and leave. Okay, that's great. But as long as you come here, you're going to hear over and over again about the value of when God's people serve his kingdom to advance the movement of Jesus. Because the mission of Lighthouse Church is to see lives transformed. And if we're coming here and sitting and checking it off and walking out, we're not seeing lives transformed. We're seeing indentions of our butts in the cushions. So we have a desire to serve the kingdom, but when we fail to steward what God has given us, we miss these opportunities. Let me put this in perspective for each of us here. All right. At some point, most everyone in here made the decision to follow Jesus. And for almost all of us, that came because of a relationship with somebody. Someone shared the good news of the gospel of Jesus with us, or someone patiently walked with us through a difficult time or patiently explained to us the love of Jesus. And for some of us, it was over and over and over and over again. Those individuals who invested in us were letting, were stewarding their time for the kingdom. And you are the result. And I am the result. So when we talk about this kingdom significance of stewardship, you are the kingdom significance of stewardship. I am the kingdom significance of stewardship. The men and women who have yet to accept Jesus but are going to are the recipients of kingdom stewardship. Here's the truth. 
in those areas that we struggle with stewardship, in those areas that we struggle serving the kingdom with what we have, sometimes it requires us to do something difficult. Sometimes stewardship requires repentance. This morning, I want to look at, at two stories. Both of them are in the Old Testament. The first is in 1 Samuel. The second is in 2 Samuel. And it's this example of two kings, King Saul and King David. Because both of these kings experienced the anointing of God over their kingship. And both of them experienced moments where they were poor stewards with what God had provided them. But the outcome for the two kings is very different. We think of King David as, I mean, it's David. It's the, it's, it's, it's the poet warrior, the man after God's own heart. And then we think of Saul. Oh, Saul who literally got the job because he was the tallest guy in the room. <laughs> Read it, it's in the Bible. <laughs> so I want to look at this. So again, we're going to jump into this, and we'll jump in at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15, verse 8. Before we do, let me give you some context. Right? Saul at this point is king of Israel. He's been appointed by Samuel the prophet to be the king. The people were grumbling. They wanted a king. They looked all over. All these other countries had a king, but they didn't have kings. And they said, we want a king. And so God said, okay, you want a king? Here's a king. Here's a tall guy. He, he is anointed as the king of all of Israel. And he was appointed king. At first, see, things seemed to be going you know, pretty well. Israel got its king. But then you start seeing Saul make some missteps. And he makes some rash decisions. And there's this one incident where Saul is supposed to wait for Samuel to make a sacrifice, but Samuel's a little late. And so Saul's like, all right, well, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'll make the sacrifice. Only problem was that Saul wasn't able to make the sacrifice because he wasn't the priest. And at the time, it required a priest to make the sacrifice. And that was a pretty scandalous thing. You want to talk about political scandals, right? Saul making that sacrifice is a political scandal to rival anything that we experience today. And so then, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul is about to fight, to attack the, the uh, Amalekites. And in this, God says, all right, Saul, he says through Samuel, God says, Samuel, tell Saul this. And he said, when you go, destroy it all. Don't take any rewards don't, we're not looking to like get the reaps of war. You're not looking to, to resource yourself. Destroy it all. Because the Amalekites were so ungodly, what they represented was actually the presence of sin in the land itself. And, and the only way to rid yourself of sin isn't to invite it into your house, to use it as resources, it's to eliminate it, right? So this was Saul's charge, destroy it all. Saul starts looking around and going, but wait, some of these things look really nice. And look at this in verse 8. And it says, and he took Agag, the king of the, Am uh, of the Amalekites, alive. And then did he destroy him? Did he kill him? No. He took him alive, but that's not what God told him to do. And devoted to the destruction of all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, of the oxen, and of the fattened calves and the lambs. And all that was good. They took what was pleasing to them. They didn't kill it. They didn't destroy it. They kept it. And would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to the destruction the word of the Lord came to Samuel. This is what he says. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, he said, Saul, Saul came to me came to came to Carmel and behold he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. Who did he set up a monument for? I said blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord and Samuel said, "What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear?" 
Saul saying, I did what God said. And Samuel's going, then what's that sound? You did what God said, or you did what you felt best before you set up a monument to yourself. They have brought them from the Amalekites and from the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we have devoted to destruction, right? So even Saul's trying to justify himself. He goes, no, 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 we took all the best to give to God. And Samuel's going, God didn't want that. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, you are not the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction, the sinners, the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Right. And don't miss this right in that. In, in the second and third line, it says the Lord anointed you king over Israel. Who put, who put Saul as king? Was it Samuel? Was it Saul? It's God. Are you not head of the tribes of Israel? God is the one who made Saul the steward of his people. It weren't Saul's people. They were God's people. God is the one who put him up there. And God is the one who's about to remove him. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoils and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of, the, of, of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took all the spoils. Now he's blaming it on others. He's justifying sheep and oxen, the best of the things. Devoted to destruction, to sacrifice. The Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the Lord... As has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. What's better, a sacrifice or obedience? That's obedience, right? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And this costs Saul his kingdom. Two chapters later, Samuel goes and anoints a little shepherd boy to be king. And that first time that shepherd boy goes against odds in, in, in an army, in a fight, the thing he says is the battle belongs to the Lord. Not the battle belong, not the spoils belong to Saul or the people or whoever. It's the battle belongs to the Lord. This cost Saul his kingdom. See, God told Samuel to tell Saul to destroy everything, except he didn't. Saul, all throughout his kingship, had this repeating problem of letting Saul get in his way. He was a poor steward of what God provided him, which was Israel itself. It was the steward of the tribes. It was king over everything. He made rash decisions. He sacrificed when he wasn't supposed to. And he didn't sacrifice when he was supposed to. And then he took spoils and tried to make it up by trying to fix it on the back end. And when all of that came crashing down, he blamed other people. At some point after this, in this line of scripture, Saul finally gets to the point where he's like, oh, no, 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 wait, wait, I'm sorry. But at that point, it's too late because he didn't lead with repentance. When confronted, he tried to justify. You see, and like the servant that Jesus talked about, when Saul was a poor steward of what God had entrusted him, it was taken away. This summer, uh, my nine, he's now 10, my nine-year-old, I gave him his first pocket knife. And we were on a camping trip and it was for his birthday and kind of had this cool thing planned. And first we gave him this little like wooden pocket knife that like had no blade on it, but it was just like practicing open and closing it. And we talked about knife safety a lot, right? And then for his birthday at the end of the trip, I actually gave him his first pocket knife. And he was really excited about it. 
But I told him when I gave him this knife, this is not just, a, this is definitely not a tool, a toy. This is a tool. This is not something to play with. And it requires responsibility to own this. And if you cannot take that responsibility, then I will take it back from you. Because when you mismanage a tool that can cause destruction, you can hurt other people. You can hurt yourself. And so if you cannot have that responsibility, son, I will take this back. And very seriously, he looked up to me and said, yes, sir. <laughs> when stewardship isn't a priority, we risk losing what God has provided. We see this again and again in scripture. The people who are poor stewards with what God provides, it is taken away from them. Now, are you saying, Joel, does that mean if I'm a bad steward with my money, God's going to make me poor? Or if I'm a bad steward with my time, he's going to take it all away? Like, I, I'm not going to promise that that's not going to, that that is going to happen. But here's the deal. I believe scripture enough and I have seen it happen enough in people. But when they mismanage what God has provided, it is taken away. One of the best decisions that we can make is to be good stewards with what he has provided. But then again, what happens when we're not? How do we get back and, and turn and repent and get back on track? That's where the second story comes in. The second story is the story of David, King David, David and Goliath, the same one who faced the giant and said, the battle belongs to the Lord, the little shepherd boy. He fought Saul for a while. He ran from him. He had a couple opportunities to kill Saul. Wouldn't do it. Finally, Saul dies through a very messy war with a very weird situation with a messenger. And David becomes king and eventually becomes king of all of Is all Judea and Israel, right? All, all Judah and Israel. Together, David is king of it all. But then David starts having some of his own mishaps. Most of us, if you, we study the story of David, we also know the story of Bathsheba because after David and Goliath, we know of David and Bathsheba. For those of you who've never heard it, I'm going to paraphrase it really quickly for you. David's king, he's supposed to be somewhere else. He's supposed to be at war. He's supposed to be leading his armies, but instead he stays home. And one day when he's kind of hanging out on the roof, relaxing, he looks over and he sees this pretty lady and she's bathing in the river and she's probably not dressed. And he's like, I think I'll have that. So he calls for this, he sends a servant to, to bring this woman to him, sleeps with her, gets her pregnant. Then he tries to cover up his sin, calls her husband back, who is fighting, who is at the war, calls her husband back, tries to convince her, her husband to go and spend the night with her. He won't do it because of how loyal he is to David. And so then, just to cover up the sin, David sends him back to the fighting, sends him to the front line and has the troops draw back, so he dies and murders him. All to cover up his sin. All because he was a poor steward first with his time, then with his subjects, his, his, the people who were under his rule. And then to hide it all, he had somebody literally murdered. Pretty rough scandal. Pretty bad. Pretty atrocious stewardship. But then David is confronted in. And in this story, I think we see the difference between David and Saul. Look at this in 2 Samuel verse 12, starting in verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan, who's a prophet, to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, and one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had very many flocks and heroes, or in herds, heroes, and herds. But the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsels and drink of his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for him, the man who had come to him. It says, and then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. What Saul's doing, he's giving, or what Nathan's doing is he's giving this analogy and he's going, look, this rich man took 
what he didn't need from someone who cherished it so much more. And David is furious. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die and shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David's hot. He's mad. Then Nathan looked at David and said, you are that man. That is what you have done. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you so much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he sh shall lie with your wives in the side and in the sun. And for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. And this is David's reaction. David doesn't blame anyone else. David doesn't say, but no, you don't know what Bathsheba did. David didn't say, she knew that I could see her. That's not what he said. David didn't blame someone else. He didn't try to make it better. He didn't try to convince God that he did the right thing. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. And we can look at these two stories. And we can look at the difference between them. Because both men sinned. Both men were poor stewards of what God had given them. But the difference is Saul tried to live in his poor stewardship and justify it. And David immediately turned to repentance. Because poor stewardship requires change. It requires us to do something. Not sit and be okay with what has been done or try to justify it or to continue to live in the poor stewardship, but it requires change. David didn't steward what God put him in charge of, and instead of looking for excuses, David looked for repentance. I have some friends, and they live in Georgia, who, who there was a time in their lives where they were unbelievably poor stewards with their finances. They got credit cards just to fill them up. If they wanted it, they bought it. They never tied, they never gave to church. The point of their finances was for their pleasure, and when they ran out of finances, they borrowed on credit and got themselves into a really, really desperate situation. Filed for bankruptcy. But then something happened and they started walking in a conviction of this, this, that stewardship requires repentance. The idea of repentance means to change, to turn, to change directions, to go the opposite way. And that's exactly what they did. And little by little they worked and not just to save, not just to pay off their debt, but to learn what does it mean to be a steward with what God has given us. And in the process they started helping other people and they paid off their debt and have helped many other people do the same thing. It's like the small group version of Dave Ramsey without a guy screaming at you to cut up your credit cards. It was a real life example of this, but it all started, it began, not with cutting a card, but it began with a change, a repentance, a turning of their hearts. So the question is what, it, what do you need to change? What do you need to turn from? How are you stewarding your time right now? 
Because some of you need to change that. And again, man, that conviction is heavy today. Because if I'm honest, I need to change that. I'm going to tell God to stop putting on my heart things to preach that I'm also dealing with. <laughs> I need to change that. What talents do you have that you're giving to God or what talents are you keeping for yourself? Do you need to change that? Matthew 22, 37 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. And that first part, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. All right? If you want, you can go look back. Last year, we did a deep dive on what this looks like. But let me kind of give you the summary. Heart, soul, mind, what that means is all of who you are. You love the Lord your God with all of who you are. You serve God with all of who you are. And out of that, you are able to love other people. And when we do that, it positions our heart in a different place to steward what has been provided for us. Not for our purpose, but for God's. Because when we are loving God with all of who we are, stewardship falls in place. So the question is, are you being a good steward with who you are, with your heart, soul, and mind? Are you loving God with all of who you are? Or are you holding something back? Are you burying something in the hole like the wicked servant? What are you keeping for yourself? Is it some of your finances? Is it your time? What are the resources? What first fruits are you keeping for you? And the question to ask after that, is it because you are not loving God with all of who you are, heart, soul, and mind? Because in the middle of that, in the beginning, in that process, for repentance to take place, we turn not away from one thing to something else. We turn away from all else and focus on God. But here's what I know. When we follow God with all of our hearts, it leads us to follow him in stewarding what he has provided. And this is the point, right? Right? We follow God with all of who we are. Our identity is found in him. Heart, soul, mind. And we live for him. And this is the thing. As we talked about this at the very beginning, the result of that is that we start impacting the kingdom of God. And we start impacting the people and the world around us. And we see lives transformed through Jesus. And stewardship is key to that. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know which area of stewardship you struggle with. But I can also tell you some of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard are people who repent and change their heart and either steward their time better, their talents better, or they even steward their money better. And it changes not just how they pursue the kingdom of God, but it changes the lives of other people because it gives opportunities for more people to come, know, come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So where is your struggle with stewardship? Maybe you're like me and it's time. Maybe it is your finances. Maybe you struggle to giving that 10. Maybe you struggle with, with, with stewarding that 90. But when we love God with all our heart, it gives us kingdom perspective and stewardship falls in place. And the results can be eternity changing. It was for me. I'm pretty sure it was for you too.